Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to The 100 Report. I'm Chris. I'm Charlie. And, well, we have finally got through the group stages. It's strange, isn't it? Because when I watch the IPL or even the PSL, it seems like the group stage goes on forever, but it feels like this has just gone, stop, stop, right, we're at the Eliminators already. How do you feel? Well, I mean, the whole tournament is five weeks. I know the IPL lasts a bit longer, but you're right. It's been so jam-packed. And the fact that obviously we've had the women's games the same day as the men's, there's been double whammies pretty much every single day. I have to admit, I've struggled to keep up with every single game. It's just been, it's been cricket overload. And speaking of cricket overload, Chris, I have to ask you about your weekend last weekend, because what is it you went to? Was it three games in the end? Yeah, it was. It was pretty... Um... Pretty full on, I've got to admit. So it was the Saturday and I went to Lords to go and watch some of the test match. Wonderful. I got to see Joe Root get his hundred. Um possibly papering over the cracks for the England cricket team, but that's that's another another point for another podcast. Uh, and then I had well, I actually bumped into Stefan Schemmel, who was on our uh, on our show, as you know, and that was quite nice to see him. And then I went to the Oval to go and watch the 100, which was a very, very full on day, but it was the London Derby. So it was quite exciting. And I got there and I saw most of the women's game and pretty much all of the men's game. But the really, at that, at that stage, it was kind of a dead rubber as far as the men's teams were concerned. Like as in, it, it was crucial the Oval had to win, but London Spirit were just well out. I mean, we'll go on to London Spirit later because unfortunately for the men's team at least, uh, it just didn't work out for them at all. So as it stands, we've got the final three for the finals this weekend, which I'm super excited about just to run through. For the women's teams, um, Southern Brave stormed ahead and finished in first by a mile. They finished with 14 points. Oval Invincibles were second with nine and Birmingham Phoenix were third with eight. Um, quite similar with the men's. Um, the men's table, we've got Birmingham Phoenix came out on top with 12. 11 for the Southern Brave at second place. And third place, Trent Rockets with 10. So similar, apart from the men had Trent Rockets and the women's had the Oval Invincibles. Yeah, it, the writing was on the wall. The Southern Brave women were just so magnificent they just stormed their way through absolutely everything they only lost one match and that was actually off a, a, a Duckworth Lewis result so it wasn't even a, a definitive loss if that makes sense but they were so so dominant and their players that they had they had Maya Bouchier, Danny Wyatt was in great form, um, Sophia Dunkley what a breakout she was fantastic I absolutely loved watch, watching her bat she was amazing um, but yeah, I mean, we, we said it to begin with, the Southern Brave women's team were looking incredible. When it came to the men's, obviously I was hoping the Southern Brave men's were looking incredible. Um, and I have to say, they I think they did really well to finish in the top three because I think they really suffered from a lot of those key stars just not turning up um, at the day. And then also obviously suffering the loss of Joffre Archer was, was a huge loss for them. But interestingly with the men's, and I was just looking through the stats because you know I love a stat. And finally the stats table is up on the website. So I've been rifling through all these numbers. Very happy bunny. Um, and interestingly, it was not necessarily the pace attack that um, succeeded. The highest wicket scorers were spin uh, and alongside most of the economy rates uh, were also up there with the spin. So that's kind of maybe where Southern Brave lost a little bit of momentum. Um, they, they suffered quite a few losses and they came back towards the end and they had to kind of, I think every game for them was a must win. And they obviously really thrive under the pressure. So I was glad to see that they finally made it to the top three. But I think we have to talk about Birmingham Phoenix when it comes to the men, because they looked incredible. And I have to say, I thought Trent Rockets and Southern Brave were looking the strongest. And Birmingham Phoenix really surprised me. They were on fire most games. I couldn't agree more. And it's interesting because Moeen Ali obviously got called up for the test series. So Liam Livingston was put in charge as a captain. But if you look at the last five matches that the Birmingham Phoenix men played, win, 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 win. So he must be doing something right. And you think of some of the players they've got. It also helps that they have a real veteran of the one-day game in Imran Tahir, who's just bowling them to victory. And with that five for 
he's just box office. I was so, so happy to see. And it's often the case in the <laughs> show. Yeah, the they got the hat trick. We had to talk about that hat trick. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, celebration, the typical Imran Tahir celebration. I was, yeah, I was so pleased for him. Um, he, he, got the, he got a five for it along with Adam Milne. Um, but Liam Livingston, we have to give him serious credit because he has had the, the season of his life. He also did so well um, uh, in the season last year. He's a really up and coming talent. A lot of people are calling him sort of saying he should be with England. So let's see whether he gets called up for them. But um, he was the highest run scorer. He got 92 not out. Interesting point the, in the women's game, also 92 not out and Jemima Rodriguez. Um, yep. So it's gonna be, it was so, such a shame that they ran out of balls, both of them, to see whether they would have got a century. I'm sure both of them would have got a century. So just, it just shows you, you've got to just absolutely go for it. Um, at right at the beginning of your innings because to reach 100 is so difficult. Um, but 92, I think that's pretty good from both of them. But Liam Livingston got the highest runs um, and the highest score. So he had the most amazing tournament. Interestingly, and the run tally for the men's, um, second place, second and third place were both of Welsh Fires players, Ben Duckett and Glenn Phillips. They also had a great tournament. So um, maybe we'll, we'll run through a bit of Welsh Fire later on, but it was interesting that neither of the, that their team didn't, um, didn't do great in the tally, although individual scores did really, really well. Yeah, I, th I think this is what I was thinking when we were just talking through the spinners and Imran Tahir and things like that. It's often a thing in the short form competitions where whoever's got the leading wicket taker is usually somewhere near the top of the uh, top of the table. Um, and it's one of those old cliches about cricket is that if you take wickets, you win matches. And I think that's uh, really quite well evidenced with the run scorers because obviously Liam Livingston was astounding. But some of the other top run scorers um, didn't really get in with much of a sniff. Um, I think, yeah, they got a consolation victory yesterday against London Spirit, which meant that they uh, they didn't go away with a wooden spoon, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, it's just been great because normally you're right. Normally the highest wicket takers um, do, you know, are other other teams are at the highest. But just to run through those, the highest wicket takers for the men's was Adil Rashid. But the Northern Superchargers didn't do that great this tournament at all. They suffered a lot of injuries themselves. Obviously Ben Stokes had to pull out early on. Um, and and with the with the women's team, Sammy Jo Johnson was on fire. She had the highest amount of wickets. But sadly the Trent Rockets didn't make it for the women's team either. So. Um, that's an interesting one for, for the wicket takers. I think actually the economy rates were more beneficial for the bowling attack um, for the teams that succeeded and went through. You, you actually said this before, um, before the competition actually even began. You called it, you said economy rate is what we need to look at here and strike rate for the batsmen. And I, I think that, that, yeah, great job. You called it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thanks for reminding me because I've forgotten all about that. Um, yeah, no, it does, it does make sense in such a short format. But um, so, I mean, standout players, let's go down. So the Birmingham Phoenix for the men, they obviously had a great, um, a great team. And unsurprisingly, we've got to talk about Adam Milne, for me, one of the standout players of the tournament. And you've got to remember that he was a last minute replacement for Shaheen Sharafridi. And at the time, I was gutted not to have Sharafridi because... You know, he's just, his bowling attack is just insane. But I have to say, huge boots to fill. And Adam Milne did totally that. He did, he did an amazing job. I think we got lucky in a lot of ways because obviously everybody was a bit devastated when like Andre Russell had to pull out or David Warner had to pull out, things like that. But you got somebody like Adam Milne. And I think that just so shows the strength in depth that New Zealand cricket have got at the moment interestingly because one of my favorite overseas performances actually came from the southern brave and it was a replacement overseas player just because i really really like watching this player um because obviously i think the original lineup who was it it was marcus stoinis david warner and um andre russell but that obviously all changed because of the international calendar and then they got quinton de Kock, devon conway and someone else who, oh colin de Grandom. and then uh, Devon Conway got injured, so they replaced him with Paul Sterling. Now, it was weird, especially, I, I don't know if you agree with me, as people who comment on this game, 
it's actually been a bit of a nightmare keeping up with who's in the team and who's not and which local teams have switched players and where the international uh, players are. Um, you brought it up actually before we recorded. Where was Liam Plunkett? <laughs> for all we know, he might have played a few games. I did not spot him at all. And I would look out for him because actually he's one of, he's one of my favourites from the England World Cup squad. I think he's a fantastic player. Yeah, I didn't see him there at all. Um, and I was, yeah, chatting to you earlier. I was like, sorry, where was, sorry, Faf Duplessis, he didn't, he didn't come on at all throughout the whole tournament, did he? No, he had the concussion and he had to go home. Um, and you're right, Devon Conway then got replaced. I actually completely missed that. And uh, I just took Sterling for just being there. I thought he must have been there since the beginning. <laughs> it is so confusing. And I have to say, when we went to watch um, the game at, at Lords a couple of weeks back, you saw that I was fuming because obviously being a devout Southern Brave fan, I was like, these aren't replacements for the stars we had before. I'm not happy with these replacements. I was fuming. Um, apart from Quentin de Kock, I wasn't necessarily happy with the other two. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know how they got into the final three, to be honest, because they lost all of their star players. But yeah, it was so confusing keeping up with who's in and who's out. And we said before we came on air that, you know, we did, I think... It's a shame that a lot of the international players and a lot of the huge stars that people were really keen to see, obviously bar a few like um, Rashid Khan, Mohammed Nabi, you know, we have, you know, Mohammed Amir, we had, we had a fair share of stars, but the big ones, they all kind of dropped out and we were really sort of ashamed about that. But what it did do was really promote county talent, homegrown talent that we have across the board. There were some real standout stars. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even just to name a couple in the women's team, Alice Capsey was a standout player for me. She was fantastic. And her economy rate was one of the highest. And we have to remember she's 16 years old, starting out her career in, in the UK. And I think it was such a great platform and it has been such a great platform for a lot of um, British talent that I think that is a huge benefit of, of the competition, but I feel like it needs to go hand in hand with those stars and let's hope that it's been a success so that next year the stars want to be involved. I, yeah, it, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. You look at someone like Alice Capsey and it's only going to benefit her game at such a young age that she's got Danny von Nierkirk on the same squad. And I remember putting a tweet out on our uh, on our social pages that I said, for me, Donny von Nierkirk is the MVP. I know that some players have been better and some people have made more runs and some people have got more wickets. But just in terms of her presence as this senior player, South African overseas, captaining the squad, bowls a bit, bats a bit, and makes it, makes it her business to get the important runs or to get the important wickets. And I think someone like Alice Capsey is only going to learn from someone as quality as Donny van Nierkirk. That is the, is the big contrast, really, because the women's squads actually did have very strong overseas players. They weren't really affected by the international calendar. The men's squads were massively affected by the international calendar, plus the test series against India, the Royal London One Day Cup, and anything and everything on top of that. So, you know, as much as I enjoyed the contest, those things really need to be brought in. And I know the thing is, you can give the the ECB a bit of leeway, given that it's a COVID year, and that these things are slightly unusual, and we're just trying to work the best way we can. I really think that next season, the 100 could benefit from having its own slot uh, at a certain point um but that's you know that's that's a minor criticism in what i've actually found to be a very enjoyable contest and yeah yeah and also just looking at how many kids and how many people that don't really care about cricket have actually started getting into it i went down to the nets the other day and we're talking this is a wednesday afternoon because <laughs> i've got a wednesday afternoon off so i went to the nets and it's usually empty. I'm usually just on my own and just sort of practicing. And I got there and it was overrun. There were a bunch of uh, 10 year olds, 11 year olds, boys, girls, all just playing cricket. And I just went, I really wonder if this is the hundred effect. Are you getting your elbows out? Like, excuse me, kids, I want to have a practice. <laughs> get One, back six, to school. Five. So it was, it was, def I'd have to bend down to get my elbows out of the way. 
<laughs> no, that is that is a fantastic um, achievement. And I think that is down to Cricket Fever. The fact that, you know, the BBC has been showing so many of the 100 games and there's been so many kids out with families enjoying such a short format. It obviously retains um, their attention. There's a lot for them to see not just obviously you don't see on television but there's all the hosts at the stadiums there's the halftime um entertainment there's a lot going on for them which is amazing and there's no doubt that the women's game has benefited beyond with the 100 and everyone is shouting it that is at the moment the best thing that's come out of the 100 which is fantastic but you're yeah you're mentioning obviously scheduling issues especially with the men's team but i want to talk about a couple of the teams that didn't make it into the top three and specifically let's look at um london spirit because they were bottom by far um in the men's table and they actually weren't um uh, bothered too much by some of the test call-ups on the england squad they had uh, zach crawley disappeared but i think that was about it from their team so they had a pretty intact team now, actually, they suffered from um, COVID in their team. A couple of their squad and staff went down with COVID. So they managed to isolate and keep the majority of the players going. But they did have that going on behind the scenes. But for Shane's, Shane Warne's team, um, I was slightly disappointed with all the experience that he has around the world, um, that they only scored three points. Um, especially having Owen Morgan fronting the team, I think that's, uh, that you know doesn't look great for his stats. He's normally... The most amazing captain and, and can captain pretty much any any side because it's all about those tactics it's all about the field positioning and just stopping every single ball which he's normally really good at um mm. Mohammed amir was one of their star players he was expensive really expensive uh, his economy rate was awful in my opinion i think josh english did pretty well as that the other overseas player i thought he was a pretty um and i guess i think he was a last minute addition as well he did really well um and mahaba nabi for someone that's supposed to be one of the best all-rounders in the world, I don't think quite has it anymore with that. Um, I thought that Adam Rushington did well. Uh, Mark Wood was obviously out. Ravi Bopara, just, I don't, he didn't make it enough with the bat regularly. He wasn't consistent. Owen Morgan wasn't consistent with the bat. I think he's slightly out of nick at the moment with the white ball. Um, yeah. So I, it's quite, I think it was quite disappointing for that team. I, yeah, I, I think a lot of that is down to relying on a specific individual. And I know that Ravi Baparo was brought in as kind of a balancer. He can bowl a bit, he can bat a bit, but he's generally a batsman who bowls. Again, he looked fairly out of Nick. Um, Owen Morgan struggled. And if you have to rely on these players, I think it was a combination of things. It's never going to benefit the team when your head coach goes down with COVID because you're going to have to do things remotely. There's going to have to be other coaches. There's probably going to be a bit of a disarray in the dressing room. And yeah, all of the players that needed to fire were just sort of struggling for a bit of form and scrapping around a bit. And that included the bowlers and the batsmen. I actually think that the one positive from London Spirit that came out, well, there's a couple, um, was, well, the biggest one for me was Josh Inglis because he just got called up for the Australian T20s. So it's proved, hopefully especially because Australia and the international circuit are struggling a little bit, that they need somebody like Josh Inglis at the, st at the top. And I'm so happy that Adam Rossington defied our expectation because both me and you were like, oh, do, how, how has he got into this squad? But then... Because he was a keeper. He only got into my squad because of that. They didn't have an alternative. So, no, you're right. Runs. So, he was, it was, you know, he, he justified his selection. Yeah, we also thought that, um, just looking at some other teams that, that didn't perform well, we did not think that Manchester Originals looked looked good at all. Um, and they didn't really perform either. Um, their bowlers were also expensive. They didn't have, um, I mean, Phil Salt did really well, I think, with the bat. And Carlos Brathwaite really tried towards the end in a couple of games and narrowly missed a couple of times. But obviously losing Josh Butler to the England to England duties um I think some of their yeah you were talking about earlier about um Matt Parkinson how mm -hmm. he was taken out of the team for a while and then put back in it didn't quite make sense their tactics were kind of all over the place I don't think Lockie Ferguson performed that well either yeah. um I guess there was no real star, a standout player for the Manchester Originals they were another no. kind of 
it's, it's a real shame as well, especially because I got so excited when they rejuvenated their team. But losing Shadow Khan and Kigi Sorobata was a big deal. And especially Lockie Ferguson, the first half of the tournament, he was kind of injured. So they lost that extra thing. It was lovely to see Stephen Finn back in the, in the public eye. And there were some, some positives. And similarly with the women's squad, and I know when we spoke to Kate Cross uh, when she was on the podcast, she was talking about the, the sort of spectacle and it just being kind of a bit overwhelming, that first one. I don't really know if that bled into the squad per se, but there were definitely moments where certain key players in their squad weren't firing. And I think a lot of it was a reliance on Lizelle Lee at the top. And as we know, Lizelle Lee can really, really get going when she wants to. But she didn't really do it until sort of game five, game six. And at that point, they're kind of out of a competition at that point. So I think similarly to London Spirit, Manchester have all of these players that at crunch times, and if they are firing on all cylinders, can get you, can get you wins. But it was just about them getting getting there at the right point because I actually think Alex Hartley um, uh, took a little while in terms of her bowling to get there and then when she did she started really making an, uh, an impact but the first few games she was a little bit expensive um, and it, it it ultimately cost them but I guess that shows that in a format this short with only eight matches to play you've got to win everything you've got to really win everything in order to guarantee your slot and I think Southern Brave women were the first team that guaranteed themselves a place. And even then, it was only after six matches. So it, it, ta it takes that. It takes that amount of constant winning to get there. Yeah, interestingly, with the Manchester Originals women's team, we were never in any doubt that that team looked like one of the strongest teams of the competition. And speaking to Alex Hartley and Kate Cross to begin with, we're um, obviously super excited to have spoken to them. Alex Hartley, even bless her, I mean, she was... she's one of the most busiest girls in the competition because she's also doing the BBC commentary as well. Um, she was even joking about, oh, when I get my first wicket for the 100, you know, because it, it did take her a while to, to, um, to get going. But yeah, it's a shame because obviously we saw their first game against the Oval Invincibles and they set such a target. We thought they definitely had it in the bag and they just narrowly missed out. They narrowly missed out on their second game as well. And they were kind of favourites, I thought, in both games. But it just shows you with the 100, obviously, the cliche, every ball counts, um, does actually carry its meaning. Um, let's move on to another team that didn't quite perform um, for the men's team. It was the Welsh Fire. Now, they also had their fair share of injuries. Ollie Pope was injured straight up um, to begin with, which is a shame. We spoke about Liam Plunkett earlier. Where was he? I don't think I saw him play. Maybe he was injured as well. I'm not sure. The first two games, they got off to a blinder. Johnny Bairstow performed fantastically and he was the leading run scorer by far after the first couple of games but a shame for Welsh Fire he had to go for England duties and I think it was just a bit too much responsibility for Tom Banton to keep up that uh, incredible opening that he had with Johnny to begin with so it never really continued at the same at the same pace but having said that we we spoke about earlier um, how Ben Duckett and Glenn Phillips were one of the highest run scorers in the whole competition. So I don't quite sort of can't put my finger on why the Welsh Fire didn't quite perform because on paper they do actually have Jimmy Neesham didn't I don't think Jimmy Neesham did had a great competition. Mm. Um, but yeah, it kind of on paper looked like it would work out and it just, they just didn't quite retain that the, the, the force they had at the beginning. And I think losing that key player at the beginning just kind of it kind of mixed mix it up too much for them. Yeah, and they also had Case Ahmad as well. And, you know, I'm so glad he played in that last match. I know that there's a lot of terrible things going on in Afghanistan at the moment, so no doubt that's going to be playing on his mind. Um, but in terms of his um, progress through the contest, he bowled some utterly masterful spells and really proved his worth. Perhaps that's in a sharp contrast to Jimmy Neesham, who d I kind of had a... T the only way I can say it is a kind of a nothing tour. Like, he wasn't terrible, but he wasn't brilliant either. And perhaps that's what you need. But I, if I could move on to uh, the Oval Invincibles, for example, because obviously the women qualified, but the men didn't. They had some interesting ones, because I remember at the beginning of the contest, we said, actually, these guys 
are my dark horse because they have overseas players that are not going to get disrupted by the um, the international schedule. That was true, but then obviously Sandeep Lamichani had uh, visa issues or, or whatnot, and we thought, okay, this is going to be a bit of an issue. But then they got to Bray Shamsi, who's the number one T20 bowler in the world. So you think, okay, that's a pretty decent swap. But I'm not quite sure what it is, because I know I saw the Oval men's team a couple of times live and there was nothing wrong with their squad I mean they had Will Jacks and Jason Roy opening and Will Jacks when I think he made 50 odds no it was only 30 odd the other day but his strike rate was 300 percent and you go that's incredible that is a wonderful thing to have and I think Sunil Narayan there was a lot of there was a lot of criticism about him perhaps he's a bit past it I don't think he had a terrible tournament at all I think he had a fairly decent tournament um I think it's perhaps um Colin Ingram didn't have the greatest of tours um but yeah it's like you say it's really hard to know what went wrong but you know I guess if we're being fair the overall invincibles were fourth so they only just missed out on qualification uh, admittedly it was by a point whereas in the uh, in the women's team um, it was by net run rate that the London Spirit women didn't qualify. But yeah, that must be a bit of a downer when you lose on net run rate, right? I mean, it's better than boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's not go there. No, I agree with you with Oval Invincibles men team. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything they particularly did wrong. And I thought Sam Billings actually did really well as a captain. Um, I don't think if you look at the stats, which I have been doing, um, you know, they didn't actually have on any of the stats, highest wicket taker, economy rate, most runs, blah, blah, their name didn't appear on any of the stats on the, on the top. They kind of were mid-table. I mean, Jason Roy was up there with the, with the run scorers. But um, I think they missed out with Sam Curran. Sam Curran is such a great short format player. He obviously had to go to England. They lost to Rory Burns, but I don't think that was that great of a loss uh, at the moment for that team. Um, let's uh, briefly touch on the, the Northern Superchargers. They were the other team in the men's that didn't qualify into the finals um obviously have to mention we've we've mentioned briefly before Faf Duplessis the star player he he couldn't make it due to concussion reasons uh, Ben Stokes um was obviously going through a lot to begin with the competition because he was missing Ben Stokes catches that we just assumed he would he would take on the boundary that that were literally set up for him to perform and he would normally um, have, have taken a lot of those and similarly with his batting um, uh, he was yeah obviously going through stuff um, you know Adil Rashid was the highest wicket taker um, but he can't carry that team on his own and, and you look down a couple of other I think Bryden Cass looked fantastic and we spoke to him at the beginning of the tournament and he was super excited to, to be joining this team but I do think that he stood out in the team as well as being a super talent and again a great platform for him because I think England eyes were definitely watching him and his name has been spoken about um so that's great but um yeah shame for them David Willey did well just I mean nothing but no one really stood out apart from Adil Rashid um I think more so with the batting didn't really perform for the Northern Superchargers my one take from this and this is a hot take so you'll have to bear with me I really hope that somebody from the IPL watched Adil Rashid and went, why is he not playing in the IPL? That, it baffles me that a player of that quality is not playing in the IPL. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to go down there because I won't shut up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, it was interesting with the men's squad. They, again, Mujib didn't really have that much of an effect. Again, not terrible, but not brilliant either. David Willey was basically a one-man army. Um, the, the similar thing can be said for the women's squad. And um, I know Jamima Rodriguez has been outstanding and one of the players of the tournament for me. Um, and they also had Laura Volvart, and I was really, really excited to see her because she's just a like a, a very aesthetic batter. But again, it took her a little while to get going. Like the first four or five matches, she didn't really make that much of an impact. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's what they were missing. But they also had Katie Le Levick, who did really well as a leg spinner. And it, it's like you said, I think it's because if somebody, had a, if somebody was a standout performer, they usually stood out in one match or two match. They weren't consistent. Jamima Rodriguez was, but they didn't have that bowler that could back them up in that way. And I think that that is what 
ultimately led to them not qualifying, which is a shame because the first three matches, I thought, well, Northern Superchargers are going to qualify straight away. Shall we move on to, before we, I know you've got some things from Twitter to chat about, but shall we quickly move on to predictions for Ooh, yeah, yeah. who's uh, going to win the tournament? Right, okay. So I think you said Southern Brave across the board at the beginning. Are you still sticking with Southern Brave across the board? Uh, might change, might change the uh, the men's uh, team uh, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, um, I think the Southern Brave for the women's. There's there's no question for me they're going to win, and I really hope that they do because they really deserve it. They've literally, as you said, won every single game so far. So mm. I hope they don't fall at the final hurdle because they seriously deserve to win the competition, Grand Slam style. Um, with the men. Um, for me, I think actually it's a toss up between the Birmingham Phoenix and the Trent Rockets. Uh, so um, I think, um, I don't know with Moeen Ali gone now from Birmingham Phoenix. Um, I think Trent Rockets under pressure do so well. They've got David Milan, Alex Hales. They always do so well under pressure with the bat. So I think I'm winning a Trent Rockets. Interesting, interesting. And what about the women? Southern Brave. Okay. Oh, of course. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, you've already said that. Right. Okay. Well, here's, here's my take. What did I say? I think I said for the women that I thought Birmingham Phoenix were going to win and they qualified, but sadly the people that I was really, really rooting for performing well have done again, had okay tournaments, not terrible, but not brilliant. And that was Izzy Wong and Abtar Maksud. Um, Amy Jones has been fantastic for Birmingham. So I uh, I think they could. They've been. A li they've won the last three. Oval have been a little bit more inconsistent. I don't know. I, I think I've got to say it's going to be Southern Brave. But if you had to ask me who I think they're going to meet in the final, I reckon it might be Birmingham Phoenix Southern Brave final, and I think Southern Brave will win. As far as the men go, Birmingham have just been winning everything for the past five matches, and again, like. It really, like you said, it depends which Trent Rockets show up on the day. And you can't discount the fact they've got Rashid Khan, they've got Alex Hales, they've got David Milan. They've got Matt Carter. Matt Carter, again, one of the uh, local domestic players that has just been fantastic. Uh, I'm going to say Birmingham Phoenix, Trent Rockets in the final, and I think Birmingham will win it. So Ooh, that, that's okay. my take. Right, we'll see, who's, we see, see who comes out top there, because I think Trent Rockets. Um, interesting. So uh, I think you've got a couple of things to read from Twitter about best bits of the competition before we round up. Yes, yes, I do. And these are everybody who's following us on social media. So if you're not yet, please do. We are on Twitter at 100 Report and we are on Instagram at The 100 Report. We're also on YouTube because you're watching this right now. So give us a subscribe and like and comment down there, all that fun stuff. So let's go through. Um, we actually had quite a lot of responses. I was a little bit surprised because um, there's been quite a lot. Um, so um, Jim Congdon has got quite a lot of ones. Um, he's uh, talking about uh, Emma Lamb's batting, um, Amanda Jade Wellington's bowling, and uh, even Paul Sterling, uh, who's sort of representing the emerging cricket nations. So yeah, uh, shout out to Ireland and Afghanistan because you guys are really making the difference in the squad. Uh, <laughs> um, Mark Puttick says, so at uh, Grillia Day C, uh, has posted a photo of when Ravi Bapara had a rather unfortunate fielding incident and uh, his pants were exposed. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's a strange one, but okay. Um, uh, Chinmay Paranjape says, all five Indian girls performing brilliantly in the 100 was my favourite. Can't argue with that. Uh, Pranjal Messi fan, which is at Cricket Geek, says Liam Livingston. Literally just says that. That's decent. That's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> um, the women's competition at GWR67 says the women's competition. And yeah, in many ways, that has been the biggest winner of the 100 for me. The idea that they keep smashing record attendances in the women's matches. I think it can only continue and it can only grow. And uh, oh, and We Burn Blue. Now, uh, I've spoken to We Burn Blue on Twitter a fair bit. Big fan of the women's game. And she's just written, uh, Jemmy's 92 not out, which I go, yeah, that was definitely one of the best ones. 
So yeah, thank you so much for all of your messages and all of your responses. And I think we should probably wrap this up. By the time that we uh, put this out, the Eliminators will probably be already going. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. Get yourself sat down, get yourself rooted in for your favorite team. And if your team got knocked out, pick another one. You know? <laughs> it's always next year. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Anyway, let's wrap up. Uh, it's been wonderful as ever, and you take care of yourself. And also to everyone listening, thank you for following us and listening in. Have a good one, and we'll see you on the next one. Meet you soon.